Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about... Um, I, I started a tradition a few years ago. Um, oh gosh, maybe 10 years ago now. Um, maybe longer than that, probably longer than that, where um, on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, instead of preaching or teaching, I would tell one of my favorite missionary stories. And that's what I'm going to tell you this morning. It's about a missionary group. And I want you to imagine this missions team. Uh, I know you guys have sent some teams out from here. And, and imagine if you sent a missions team of about 40 young people out, and uh, you knew they were going to go on a dangerous mission. And, and uh, sure enough, within the first year, about half of them died. And uh, the rest of them never came back. I, you would probably decide, yeah, let's not send any more missionary teams out, right? You know? Well, wait a minute, maybe we could send one more missionary team out, because I could p- handpick a few people I'd like to go on that missionary team, right? You know? <laughs> so, well, that's really what the story of Thanksgiving is about. It's about a missions team. It's a team that was sent out from a church to scout out a place where the rest of the church could go and begin to worship the Lord freely and worship Him in freedom. And this, uh, this is a story of really gratitude, as Joel had shared, a gratitude in the midst of lack, gratitude in the midst of need. And, you know, I don't... The Bible talks a lot about giving thanks and thanksgiving and gratitude. You know, we all know that, you know, and everything gives thanks. Why? Because this is the will of God. And it talks about doing everything without grumbling or complaining. I'm not sure we really take that passage too seriously, right? You know, do everything without grumbling or complaining. If you listen to me, a lot of times it would be like, oh, you know, I grumble and I complain too much. I don't do everything without grumbling and complaining. But that's what the scripture tells us to do. In fact, I think God takes it a whole lot more seriously than we do because in another place in Scripture we find out that one of the reasons he sent a death angel among the children of Israel in the wilderness is because they were grumbling and complaining. Man, aren't you glad he doesn't still do that? The church would be very thin this morning, right? <laughs> Most of us wouldn't be here if every time we grumbled or complained, it was whack, whack, that's it, end of you, you know, start over again. Because we tend, to be, we tend to be grumblers and complainers by nature. There's always something wrong, right? It could always be better, right? And um, this is a really a story of um, some people who, who trusted God, who were obeying God, and yet everything didn't just open up for them. And it is. It's the story of Thanksgiving. And uh, I, I was telling this, sharing this one story. Like I said, I've done this for years now on the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And a guy come up to me afterwards and says, well, that's a nice story and that's okay for you. But you see, my ancestors didn't come over from England. My ancestors came up through Mexico. Or my ancestors came from Asia. Or my ancestors didn't come over on the Mayflower. They came over on a slave ship. Or, well, my ancestors were here to greet your ancestors when they arrived. You know, Native Americans or whatever, you know. And I told him, I said, brother, you missed the whole point of this. This isn't about black or white or ancestors or anything like that. This is about people who loved God, who are passionate about serving the Lord, and that makes them my people. You know, it's, that's like saying, well, you know that story about the little kid who went out and killed the giant? Well, that was a Jewish kid in Israel. I'm not Israeli and I'm not Jewish, so that story doesn't have any effect on me. What? Are you crazy? It's like saying, you know, right now, uh, we've, we've probably heard about the missions team in um, Haiti that was kidnapped. But do you know, we have missionaries there. One of our missionaries, wonderful brother, is a pastor. He's Haitian there, and he pastors in Port-au-Prince. And uh, he was telling us that the gangs are running Port-au-Prince right now. In fact, they've come into a wedding and kidnapped the pastor, and they've come in, they routinely have been coming into churches during services and kidnapping the pastor and a few congregants and demanding ransom. And, and that's like me saying, well, that's in Haiti, Haiti, and I'm not Haitian, and he's black, and I'm white, so that doesn't affect me. What? It's got nothing to do with the color of skin that God wrapped us in. If it, it, it makes no difference what if these people are from Europe, or if they're from Africa, or if they're from Asia, or wherever. The fact is, if they are born again, they're my brothers. They're your brothers, your sisters. This is, this is our heritage, no matter what your physical background is, because we have been born again into one family. And no matter what color skin we're wrapped in, we have the same father. And we have the same big brother. And we have the same blood flowing in our veins, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Wow, that's good. We are one family. And what affects you affects me. And, and, and when you win a victory, I win a victory. 
And so what we're going to talk about this morning happens to be some guys who came over from Europe, but it's our heritage because we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and it's our family. And in fact, what they did, the courage that they showed has affected your life and my life. That's a pretty effective missions team that's affecting lives 200, 300 years later, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you like for your life to make a difference 300 years from now if the Lord hasn't returned by then? And so that's what we're going to look at this morning is the story of these, um, what they, they called themselves pilgrims. We've adopted that term for them, but they called themselves that because they read in 1 Peter where it says, hey, we're just passing through this world. We are foreigners. We are aliens. We are pilgrims passing through this world. We're looking for another city. We're looking for another world. This world is not our home. We're on our way to somewhere else, and we're pilgrims through this land. And so they adopted that term for themselves. And what had happened was they were being persecuted where they were in England, and they were being persecuted because they were crazy, radical, fanatical Christians that believed some outs outlandish things, and it brought persecution. I mean, you want to know a couple of the outlandish things they believed? <laughs> they actually believed that you could receive guidance from the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Who believes that? Can I see a hand or two? We believe that, don't we? Well, you see, that was crazy and outlandish. It was at that time. And you know what else they believed that was really just nutty, off the scale crazy? They actually believed that Jesus was the head of the church. What? You go, well, that's not crazy. The reason we don't think it's crazy is because they put up with the persecution and they put up with the hard times. They went against the flow. Because in their day, if you said Jesus was the head of the church, no, 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 no. If you're a Catholic, the Pope's the head of the church. If you're Anglican, if you're Church of England, the king's the head of the church. We listen to the king. We listen to the Pope. And they came along and said, no, 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 no. Jesus is the head of the church, and he still speaks to his people from his word and by his spirit, and we listen to him, and we obey him. Amen. And if the king and him disagree, we choose Jesus. Amen. And, you know, we may be facing that ourselves here one of these days soon, too, you know, where we have to make a choice between what the world says and what the word says. We better be grounded in the word, because otherwise it's easy to slip over here and, and follow what the world and what... what the government says, and we may face some persecution ourselves. They did, and they stood strong, and they swam against the stream and upcurrent, and that's why today we don't think anything. of. Of course Jesus is the head of the church. Of course the Holy Spirit still speaks to us through the word. Of course, but that's because they fought the fight. We may be one that has to fight the fight for our next generation. So let's, let's look at their lives because the reason this is so pertinent is not only because of Thanksgiving and the first Thanksgiving and the pilgrims and all that, but I believe one of the strengths that they had that enabled them to endure was their gratitude and the fact that they had a heavenly perspective, not an earthly perspective. They were looking for another world, a better world to come. And so whatever difficulties came, they, um, they were able to endure because they were looking for another world. So let's travel back with me to early 1600s in England. And here was this group that uh, knew that uh, they were swimming upstream, they were being persecuted, they were being concerned that their kids weren't serving God and they were losing a generation because of the, the world that they lived in. They said, we have got to go somewhere for the sake of our family, for the sake of our kids, and for the sake of the freedom of, of being able to worship God according to the, the direction of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. And so they, they started to pray. And they had heard about terrible things that had happened in North America. You maybe remember in school about the Jamestown Foundation, the Jamestown Colony, and how it had disintegrated and died, and there was a starving time, and horrible things happened, and the, the harsh weather on the East Coast, and the terrible things here. And so they, they concluded the best place to go would be to go to South America. And so they began to pray about that. Lord, where in South America do you want, want us to go? The weather's better. It's more receptive. And as they prayed, they just sensed, no. I want you to go to North America. Well, Lord, that doesn't make any sense. It's terrible there. It's harder there. It's more difficult there. It makes more sense. Have you ever, have you ever had the Lord direct you to do something that just didn't make much sense? I mean, this made more sense. And he says, no, that's not what I want you to do. You want to do this? I want you to do this. Well, that's what they were faced with. And so they prayed. And when they finally became convinced that this is what the Lord has for them, um, 
here's what they wrote. And, and by the way, what I'm sharing with you is actually from the firsthand account of William Bradford was one of their leaders, and he wrote a book. He wrote, he diaried what happened, and he journaled what happened. It's probably available in your local library. It's called Of Plymouth Plantation. You can read this for yourself. It's, a, it's an amazing story. And so it's firsthand accounts, not the stuff you get in school. Okay, this is, this is the real stuff. Okay, and so he said, as they prayed, and they really realized this doesn't make much sense, but we feel like the Lord says, go to North America. Here's what he wrote. And so it was concluded that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties. Wow. You know, we tend to think, well, I'm doing this for Jesus. I'm doing this for God. So it's going to be like walking out to H-E-B, and I walk up, and the doors are just going to open before me, and I just walk into it. It's going to be wonderful. And we get surprised sometimes when we're doing something for God, and poof, you hit a wall, right? The door didn't open. You walked right into it, huh? And you have difficulty, and you have struggles. But I love this. They determined that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulty. So what do you do about it? Those great difficulties must be undertaken. You don't back down just because it's going to be hard. You go for it. You have to go for it. If this is what God's saying, you got to go for it. It must be undertaken and overcome with greater courage. Wow. You know, faith is important, but sometimes it just takes courage to, be, to have faith. You just have to step out and do it and trust that God is going to be there for you. And so... We, we have these difficulties that we encounter, and maybe right now you're going through a difficult time, and maybe it's because you're involved in a great and honorable action. Maybe you're caring for kids right now. That's an honorable thing to care for your kids, but boy, it can be, it can be accompanied with great difficulties, can't it be? Yeah. Or maybe you're, maybe you're caring for aging parents, or maybe you're just struggling to provide for a family and an economy that seems to be tanking. Maybe you're just, whatever the difficulties, maybe you're struggling with health and problems like that. You know, if you're engaged in a great and an honorable uh, action, God's going to be with you through that. Sometimes we bring the things on ourselves, but if you're doing what God's called you to do and difficulties come their way, just hang in there. Just hold on and gut it out because they're undertaken and overcome with greater courage. And then they went on to say, the next line, he says this. So whatever great dangers... And difficulties lie ahead. He says, we don't know what's coming, but whatever is coming, whatever comes, we're going to decide right now what we're going to do about it. You know, the best time to make a decision is before you have to make a decision. So that when you have to make a decision, you've already made the decision. You're not in the midst of the crisis situation. You're not pressured by it. Decide ahead of time. I'm going to do what's right because it's right to do right, regardless of the consequences. Simple as that. And then when you have to get there, whew, this is going to be hard but I'm going to do what's right because I've already decided. They decided ahead of time. Whatever great dangers and difficulties lie ahead would, through the help of God, we're not doing this in our own strength. We trust in God. He's our ultimate source, but it's not all God. He counts on us to do a part two. Through the help of God, with fortitude and patience. Sometimes we just have to hang in there. Fortitude, courage, patience. You know, the scripture says in Hebrews, it says, you have need of patience after you've done the will of God that you will then inherit the promise. Sometimes we do the will of God and we're going, well, 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 nothing came of it. It didn't. No, you have need of patience. And they said, so these difficulties with the help of God, but with fortitude and with patience, they're either going to be overcome or endured. Wow. I mean, we talk a lot about overcoming. But sometimes when you get in those difficult times, sometimes there's no overcoming. Sometimes you just have to gut it out and go right through it and just endure, cling to God, hold on, knowing that the longest, driest, hardest desert, you'll get through it if you just keep walking. You just Sometimes you just have to gut it out and endure. You ever been there? And, and we, we want God to just deliver us, and we're overcomers, and we're victorious. And many times he does that. But sometimes we're like Joseph in the prison. You just have to gut it out, knowing there will come a time of deliverance, but it's not right now. And so you just endure. You just hang on to God. He's all you can hang on to sometimes. So you just hold on to him and knowing, I don't know what's going to come of this. We don't know what lies ahead, but I do know this. I'm going to hold on to him, and he will get me through. 
And that was the attitude they had. And so they, they launched out in these ships, and they, they had a lot of things that happened. They were supposed to go in two ships, and they ended up having to, to all cram into one. And, and so they're, they, they're ready to leave England now and head to the New World. And um, like I said, they, they had all kinds of problems that set them back. And so they're, before they even leave England, they're already eating into the stores of food that are supposed to help them survive the winter when they get into the New World. And they all end up having to cram into one boat. They were going to take two, and some problems developed. And so here's, here's the scenario. Imagine 102 people crammed into an area the size of a volleyball court. Picture a volleyball court, and then put 102 people on it, and then realize they're in this cramped, dark, smelly hold of a boat. They couldn't go up on the top of the boat because for the 66-day trip across the, across the ocean, all six, all days, there was a terrible storm. So now you're in a in this uh, space crammed in, you can barely stand in those ships, smelly ship, animals, kids, people. Sixty six days in the dark, down below, and twenty four hours a day, you're tossed around and rocking because it's a storm the whole time. Man. <laughs> be hard to find that as your happy place, wouldn't it, you know? <laughs> and so for, six, for over two months, they're in this situation. And think about this, too. You know, animals and well, people begin to smell a little bit, too, after 66 days with no shower, right? They had no shower facilities. They had no bathroom facilities, no toilet facilities. And so that you can imagine what this place began to smell like, how unsanitary it was, the horrible environment and the horrible situation. And yet, in those 66 days, some of the, actually, actually, some of the crew of the Mayflower died, but none of the pilgrims died. God kept them through that entire time, and they all made it across the ocean. Two and over two months of that situation, 24 hours a day, just tossed and turned with children and crying and all the things that goes with that. And they landed in, in, in November. They found Land Ho. But then they found out that they had been blown off course. And so they tried to adjust, and they set sail to go to where they had initially planned to land. And every time, the wind blew them back in. And so finally they said, okay, look, we're trusting God in this, right? Obviously, this is where he wants us. And so what they found was that the storm didn't blow them out of God's purpose, but it blew them into God's purpose. Does that make sense? You ever been in a storm, and you, you wonder... If you're off course and you found later, it's really just God bringing you about where he wanted you to be. And so they determined this is where we're supposed to be. And they, they said, well, let's go in. And they, they landed and went in and were, were just shocked to find that there was a place that had already been cleared out. You know, we hear all these stories about the, uh, the pilgrims and the, the early settlers and how they mistreated the Native Americans. And, and I'm sure many did, but these guys didn't. These guys treated, these guys came as believers and they were there representing the kingdom of God. And so they, they found a spot and, and nobody owned it and they didn't know what was going on. It was already cleared out. If you ever developed any land in the hill country, you know you got to clear a whole bunch of cedar before you can even do anything, right? Here was a space already cleared out for them. So they had no idea why, but it was November, it's getting cold, it's freezing. They start building, and, and they have a horrible winter ahead of them. And during that winter, these people were, were not... By the way, you, you know, we, we see the pictures that we see of the pilgrims with the big black hats and the big belt buckles. and that, 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 Those weren't the pilgrims. That was a group that came later. That was not the pilgrims. These pilgrims, and they were not old men with whiskery beards that looked like their face was going to crack if they smile. You know, that's what we see these pilgrims as, right? You know, oh, real stuff. That was not the pilgrims. That was the group that came later. This group were young people. A third of their group were under the age of 17 years old. And they were families, young families. And the oldest, their leaders were like in their 30s. So it's 20s and 30s and, and, and teenagers. These are, these are the group that came and it's 102 that came across. And, and in this group then, they, they also um, didn't wear all black like that. They wore colorful clothes. They enjoyed sports. They were j really just people like us who were just loving life and, and following what they felt was God's call in their life to come and prepare a place where their church could then later follow. The rest of their church was going to come later and establish a place for them. And so they were like the pioneers sent out ahead of time. And they, they enjoyed um, life, and they enjoyed, um, in fact, unlike what, all these things we hear about the Puritans here, close the kids' ears, they enjoyed sex as well. 
You say, well, how do, you, how do you know that? You know, that's sure not what the puritanical thing is. Well, first of all, they had a bunch of kids. You know? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, but it's cold nights and no TV. What else are you going to do, right? You know, so, no, no, no. <laughs> but in their writings, this is, a, this is a, one of the amazing stories I was reading through. I go, man, this is really unbelievable. This is really cool. One woman actually went to the town council and complained that her husband was withholding himself too much. So the town council investigated, and they threw him in the stocks. You know, you know where they put the hand through and you put the head through like that, you know, and everybody would walk by and say, what's he in for? Oh, he stole something. What's he in for? And they come, what are you in for? Well, I'd rather not say. <laughs> you know, it's like, they were, they were, they were not what we think of as the, as the, uh, the Puritans were the people we're talking about. They were not puritanical in any means. These were just young, young people who loved God and were out serving the Lord and doing what God called them to do. But after the end of that first winter, it was devastating. Almost half of the group died. In fact, of the 18 wives in the group, 13 of the wives were dead. There were only three families that were not broken, who had, had not lost a child. So we had children dying. We had wives dying. We had husbands dying. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible thing. And yet in the spring... And I'm sure every day they knelt down. And, and the, in the writings, William Bradford says this about it. He says, through it all, through all this difficulty, their hearts remain soft before the Lord. Man, that just brings tears to my eyes. Because I go, you know, I've had, I've had less traumatic things than that happen to me. And I tend to want to get hard. And I want to get mad at God and blame God. You know, and, and realizing their hearts. And, you know, you realize the same sun that melts the clay hardens the wax. And when difficulties come into our lives, we can do one of two things. When that sun starts beating down on you, you can either get hard and blame God and be mad at God, or you can allow it to soften your heart and say, God, I don't know why I'm going through this thing. I don't want, I don't want my will. I want your will to be done. And that's the heart. That was the heart these people demonstrated. And it's, a, it's an example for us that when those difficulties come, Soften your heart before the Lord. Lord, I don't understand what's going on, but not my will, but your will be done in this. And, I, and, and your kingdom come and your will be done. And so that was the attitude they had, was a soft heart before the Lord through all these difficulties and all these troubles. And um, they, they, that spring, that's when the Native Americans showed up to help them. And you've probably heard of the guy Squanto. You know, Squanto was a was a was an American Indian, Native American, and he had been um, he was a part of that tribe. He he explained what happened, why there was a blank space for them when they arrived. Because what had happened, he there had been a tribe there that were fierce and, and terrified all the other tribes around. They were fierce warriors, and one year they were wiped out in a plague. And so all the other said, Whoa, that land is cursed. We want nothing to do with it. That's where God blew these pilgrims. There had been a place prepared for them. And when they went ashore, the land belonged to no one. No one else wanted it. It was just sitting there waiting for them. God had so prepared a place for them. He goes ahead of us, folks, and prepares a place for us. Just like Psalm 23 says, you know, he prepares a place for us in the presence of our enemies. So, so anyway, it was a wonderful celebration. But again, winter's coming again. And they know it's coming. And sure enough, winter comes and sure enough, their stores run a little short. It's a hard, hard winter. And during the winter, not one of them died, but it got so bad that at a certain point in the winter, their rations per day, and think about this. These are young, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-olds. They eat a lot, right? And all the parents said, amen. They eat a lot. Their <laughs> rations were reduced at one point in time to five kernels of corn a day. You get the connection? The five kernels of corn a day, but not a one of them died that winter. They all survived. And each time they're expressing gratitude for God. And I think, you know, it would have been very easy to, to focus upon what they didn't have and how this many had died and this had lacked instead of being grateful for what they did have. And they expressed gratitude. And that next fall, again, they had a big feast and a big celebration thanking God. But the first thing that was served on everybody's plate was five kernels of corn. Lest we forget, they said, lest we forget. And you know, the Bible talks about forget not all the Lord's benefits. It's easy to forget his blessings to us. It's because we look at what we don't have. And here we are coming up probably to a season of the year when there's more depression and more discouragement and more dissatisfaction. Christmas, 
oh, my kids want this, and I want that, and I don't, you know, I'm not going to get what I want. And, and, and so that's why I gave you those five kernels of corn. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you a, you can call it a game or you can call it a challenge, whatever you want. It's a, a gratitude challenge. I believe one of the things that caused them to be able to survive was, one, they were grateful for what they had instead of grumbling and complaining about what they didn't have. But the reason they could do that is because they had an eternal perspective. We're just pilgrims. We're just passing through here. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to gather a bunch of junk that I have to carry with me through this life because I'm moving on to somewhere else. And they understood that, that we're just pilgrims passing through. So those five kernels of corn, here's what I want you to do. Take those with you and put those in a pocket. Guys or ladies, maybe you'd want to get you those little baggies you have. You can put, get you two little baggies and put them all in one little baggie and put it in your purse and get another little empty baggie because here's what you're going to do. During this week, during this next week, start in the morning with all five kernels of corn in one pocket, and I want you to then take one out and move it to the other pocket, but, but you can only do that because you've expressed gratitude to someone for something. Maybe it's to the Lord. You get up in the morning, thank you, God, that I'm awake this morning. Okay, I can move one kernel over to there. And then maybe you thank your spouse for something. You can move something over to there. But during the day, for this next week, I want you to make it your goal to be able to move all five kernels of corn to the other pocket or from one baggie to another baggie because you've, maybe you've written a card thanking somebody. Maybe you've contacted somebody, called somebody, texted somebody, just saying, hey, I just want to thank you for the, for the blessing you are in my life, for just being in my life. I want to thank you for that. And use these little kernels of corn as an, as an act of training ourselves to be grateful and it can change your life but if you're really radical we have anybody who's really radical I mean you're really fanatical you're really crazy for Jesus okay all right we got well for the two of us here um, <laughs> here's here's what I'm going to encourage you to do if you really you really want to take this to the next level do it from now till Christmas just like four weeks it's like a month like a month of being grateful can you imagine how that could change your life and change your focus and, and no grumbling and no complaining we're going to actually believe that, proper, that in Philippians where it says do everything without grumbling and complaining maybe Thessalonians it's like Elijah and Elisha eh, whatever <laughs> Thessalonians it's in there somewhere it's past the, it's before Revelation and after Matthew it's in there somewhere okay but it says to do everything without grumbling without complaining without murmuring and maybe we could just do that. And I guarantee it, it will change our lives. It will change our perspective. And maybe these little five kernels of corn be a reminder to us to do that. Every day, just make it your goal to be able to move all five of them to the other pocket. Let me close with one passage here in Scripture. It says this. Um, in Philippians 4, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. That's okay. It's all right to express your needs to the Lord. That's not grumbling. That's not complaining. Just tell him what you need. But then thank him for what he's already done. That's a big part of it. Thank him for what he's already done. And you know what the promise is? He says, if you will do this, the peace of God will guard. It's, it, it literally means stand garrison over, stand guard at the door of your heart and your mind. The peace of God will guard your heart, your emotions. Sometimes our emotions just seem to stir all up and they seem out of control, don't they? We need to guard those, don't we? And he says, the peace of God will guard your emotions and your mind. Sometimes your mind is just, you just can't shut it off and it's just going over here. And it just seems like there are these wild horses that you can't control and they're going all over the place. The peace of God will guard your heart and guard your mind. If you'll, don't, don't be anxious about it. Cast your care upon him and pray about it Tell him what you need, but then thank him for what he's already done. And all of a sudden, as you begin to thank him, you'll begin to realize, wow, I have a lot to be grateful for. I have a lot to be grateful for. Thank him for what he's already done. And he promises that the peace of God will guard, will stand garrison over your heart, your emotions, and over your mind. Could you use a little of that? I could use a little of that. Let's pray. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.